Good morning, everybody. Good to see your beautiful faces. And those of you that are online, welcome. It's good to be together worshiping um, here in person and together as the church, you know, on his day, right? It's awesome. And he's up to amazing, amazing things. I want to just say something in regards to something uh, Spencer mentioned about the media. You know, it's incredible to, to note that before this year even began, we were feeling and, and sensing from Jesus that he wanted to position us to, to broadcast his wonders out to the world, you know? And it's just, it's just amazing to me to think about that even right now, we have people watching all over the, the world, all over our nation, of course, all over the South Florida region. It's so incredible. And so what God's doing here and the volunteers that serve, how many of you know that's really, really important as lives are being touched through what's being broadcast? Amen? It's, it's, it's really, really incredible. And next Sunday, of course, we will be gathering in our homes. And I think connection on a smaller group level ultimately is what's going to change the world. Because that's where we really get into each other's lives and we really get to have iron sharp and iron. We get to know the needs going on in each other's hearts and be able to pray for those. Um, it, it's a great space to invite somebody that would maybe never just show up uh, to some building on a Sunday morning with people they don't know, right? It's, it's a great way to, to, to leverage those relationships that you have with people that maybe don't know Jesus and say, hey, we're hanging out at this house, you know, Sunday and love to have you come with me. It's, it's incredible. So Harbor at Home is a really, really powerful tool. And if you've been around this, this community for any time, um, you know, we did home fellowships on Sunday mornings for the first 15 years, three Sundays out of the month. And the transformation that we saw happen in that season was just, it was mind blowing. And we've been in a, in a season leading up to this moment that's been so beautiful and so preparatory for this very moment. But I want to tell you, I want to encourage you, like, let's gather together. If you're like, well, Darren, what do you mean? What do I need to do? Listen, just make your space available and say, hey, I would love to have you come over. Talk to somebody today and say, hey, would you want to join me next weekend at my house? And let's just get together, you know, engage in the worship, you know, listening to the teaching that's coming forth. But it's not about just getting preached to. It's about having a conversation and diving in to those, those, those questions that we really want to take a look at. And so everybody's voice can come into that conversation, right? And be able to share our hearts on what we're seeing, what we're feeling about what was, what was spoken last weekend with Bill Vanderbush. That message, if you didn't hear that and you didn't have an opportunity to get in a, in a Harbor Home group and have a conversation, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Listen to it multiple times. I told our staff this last week what he taught on literally could be a constitution for the kingdom of God. Like, like foundational reality for what this kingdom is all about and how we enter in to what Jesus has provided for us. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Now listen, if you're interested in knowing more about Harbor at Home and hearing some incredible testimonies of stuff that has happened in the past, we're going to be having a Zoom call to inform you um, of what we're getting ready to do in the new year with Harbor at Home and a launch that we're, we're really planning going full force official first weekend of February. And we'd love to invite you into that conversation. Maybe you're like, listen, I have a heart for people that feel disconnected or people that come and sit in buildings with no matter how many numbers and still feel alone. Come on, somebody. That's, that's the reality right now. And listen, all that's been going on in our culture and in our nation since March, it's just been continually polarizing people, isolating people, right? And God wants us to come together. He wants us to come together. In fact, in Hebrews, he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, large and small gatherings, as some have grown accustomed to doing. How many of you know that that's, there's, there's something at work here that's bigger than what we see going on that's trying to get people accustomed to being disconnected? 
And so it's important for us to fight for this, to fight for people that, that are out there that feel alone, feel by themselves. Come on. And just a simple ask, hey, I would love to get together with you. I would love to hear how you're doing. I would love to spend some time. How many of you know that that's what Jesus did? That's what he would want us to do in this time. Amen? So enjoy and, 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 and dive in next Sunday as we experience Harbor at home. It's going to be awesome. Listen, I want to I jump into the word, but I want to I set a context for what I'm getting ready to say and why I'm going to say what I'm, what I'm fixing to share with you. But before I do that, I want to tell you this is a significant Sunday in the history of our region. And the reason is, is that with what God has been doing in the lives of leaders for the past three to five years in this region, something profound is going on in South Florida that I've never seen in the 20 plus years that I've been here. It is unbelievable what God is doing in the hearts of those leaders that say, Jesus, I want you. Just give invitation to the Lord and say, I want you. He is coming and visiting people in a prof- across denominational lines in a profound way. And what's happening is there's a unification without uniformity happening that is unprecedented, in my opinion, in, in the history of this region. We are standing on the shoulder of giants that have labored and prayed and, 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 and sought God for this reality many years leading up to this moment, but right now we're living in this moment. You've got to catch this because when you have a window that's open and now you're seeing, oh my gosh, for years and years and years this has been prayed and now we're in this moment, man, it's time to move. It's not time to just sit back and just kind of laissez-faire, like wait for whatever is, is busy happening just to happen. No, we jump in to what God is doing. And today we're starting uh, a regional, actually it's now spread into five counties, all three, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, um, Broward, of course, but now it's gone up the Treasure Coast, five counties of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastors are preaching one with one voice one sermon series for the entirety of this month of november come on and it's titled undivided we go together undivided we go together that's why you got to hear bill's Vanderbush's message from last week, the, our union in Christ, if you don't understand that we are one in him, we are undivided, we are moving forward. So today I get to launch that and uh, here at the harbor and I'm honored, I'm honored to get to share with you. And I'm going to be talking about Jacob's ladder. We're going to take a look at the life of Jacob and his experience and how that is relevant I believe to our unity, and I believe this moment. I believe this moment. I heard there's an election happening Tuesday. Anybody hear about that? I appreciate, you know, zealous people. You know, I I actually am drawn to fringe people, like fringe on whatever side, like those radicals that are just so zealous about whatever. Like, I mean, on another topic, I mean, I'll meet like new agers and stuff that are just so passionate about spiritual things, but know nothing about Jesus. And I have this dream in my heart. I'm like, I, and I say this to the Lord, I'm like, those kind of people could make the best Christians. You know what I mean? Because at least they're passionate about something, you know? And if that passion is redirected and put into the right pathway, you could really see some some, some life change personally for them, and then they having an impact and change and transformation on the world around them, right? There's a quote that I was looking at this, this last week. It said, um, as you climb the ladder of success, be sure it's leaning against the right building. Because could you imagine like giving your passion 
I mean, everything that you have for the entirety of your life and at the end find out that really it was like going towards the, the, the wrong thing that actually really didn't mean anything at the end of the day? Could you imagine? So at the beginning of this year, just as I'm setting the stage for what I want to talk to you about, I had, a, I had an experience with Jesus. I really did, like a for real, legit encounter with God that I don't have all the time like this. And it had to do, you've been hearing about it, with getting back to the basics. Because pre-COVID, God said, there's a shaking that's coming and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And I was laying in a hospital bed, not doing too well for myself at the moment. I was like, Lord, that's the last thing I want to hear. I was looking it through like a woe is me lens. And he's like, Darren, listen, you're not getting the point here. If everything that can be shaken will be shaken and that which remains is of me, that means at the end of the day, those that will let go of everything that's not eternal, not really important to grab a hold of what is, they will get me. Okay, now that may, that may just have went by you, but just let me ask you a question. If we as the church don't get Jesus, then what is the point? What does all of this mean if we're holding on to all these things, we're feeling all unstable about whatever is going on in the world, and maybe we're experiencing that because we're not holding on to stuff that can't be shaken, that will not be shaken, that cannot be shaken, that will never be shaken, and putting our energy and our attention and our focus into those three things, which I've come to discover is faith, it's the gospel, it's hope, it's that his promises are true and they will be fulfilled in our lives no matter what little voice you hear in your ear. And love that we are called out of those experiences with what Jesus has done and with the promises that we hold that begin to come alive when we immerse ourselves in the gospel and we are go to go and give it away. To spread this reality called the kingdom of God, called the government of God in the earth. And he wants our passion and our desire and the ladder that we're climbing to be against that reality, first and foremost. So Jacob's ladder. I want you to look with me because we don't have this on the screen. I, I, I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles here to Genesis chapter 28. And as you're turning, one of my favorite poets, really, in the body of Christ, worship leader, his name Jason Upton, and he wrote a song about Jacob years and years ago. And it really, it really fits with what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing right now at the moment. And this is what the first stanza of his song said. It says, Jacob has a dream for all the ages. You see, we're meant to dream. We're meant to design by God to make an impact on the world. We're meant to be passionate. We're meant to be committed to, to, to things that move our hearts. He said, Jacob had a dream to build a nation. Then Jason says, but your striving is in vain when your only aim is to build your own great name. Your striving is in vain when your only aim is to build your own great name. And I would submit that the spirit of the world, the spirit of the age, is all linked into power, name, and prominence. And we look to those things to save us. Jason continues and he says, because my dream, Jacob, is not what you do. Jacob, will you dream for me like I have dreamed for you? God has a dream for his church and he has a specific dream for his church right now at this moment. And so could you dream with me for just a minute? as we briefly take a look into the word of the Lord. 
Historical context for Jacob, we know that he's actually the most prominent figure in the book of Genesis. From his birth in chapter 25 of, of, of Genesis to his death in 49, he's all through those, those portions of scripture. He's, he's a third generation starting from his grandfather Abraham. You guys know the story of Abraham. His, his dad Isaac, who was put on the altar, born supernaturally to 90 plus year old parents, right? He's a third generation it's living on the earth where the promises of God he are, 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 are just waiting to be filled in, in this one. He's the fraternal twin of his older brother Esau. You guys know that story. And his name is named Jacob because it literally means heel grabber. It means ambitious one. One who longs for power. One who longs to be known. And, and we know the story. He uses deceit, the Bible actually uses the word guile, he's, he's a deceiver to surpass his brother's position in the family lineage to, to get the blessing and have power to actually really do something. But he has this encounter with God at this place that he named Bethel, which means the house of God, that surely God is in this place. And his name is changed to Israel. Now what I want to submit, I'm going to talk about Israel as a nation, but I want you to see it through the lens of parable, of hyperbole, that, that there's actually a spiritual nation called the church that's going to manifest actually through Jacob's lineage in Jesus that God is longing to see established in the earth right now that's going to manifest his government. His government. Because Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And again, this nation that was being raised up was a shadow of the government of God that was to come through Jesus. So let's look at this encounter. Genesis chapter 28. He's at a low point in his life. How I many of you know a lot of times encounters come at low points? <laughs> when you're desperate. All right, so he, he's at this low point. Verse 10 in chapter 28, it says, Meanwhile, Jacob had left Beersheba and traveled to Haran. And at sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. And Jacob found a stone that he could rest his head against. So interesting, Jesus referred to in the New Testament as the rock of God, as the stone of God. And Jacob finds this rock to rest his head upon after being exhausted, after, after running through the night, after being in a time of trouble, and he lays his head down to sleep. And it says in verse 12 that as he slept, he dreamed, you gotta catch this, of a stairway going from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth and angels were coming up from the stairway and going down from the stairway and there was this interaction in this place when he had this dream. And it says in verse 13 that at the top of the stairway stood the Lord, stood the Father. The one that, that, uh, that was being mentioned this morning that, that we long for, that we want to run to, that we want to be uh, concerned by. He's standing at the top of this ladder. And the, and the father says to Jacob, he says, I am the Lord your God, the one that your grandfather worshipped, and the one that your father worshipped. And he said that the ground that you're lying on, the space that you're inhabiting belongs to you. So he starts speaking about ownership, about possession of the land. Like, listen, something is changing in this moment. It's not just you had a nap, had this dream, and then all of a sudden you wake up and nothing's different. No, the ground that you're now laying on, I've given it to you. I've given it into your possession. Question, do we think about things like the reality that, that, that we're the ones entrusted right now in this moment? for our cities, for our neighborhoods, for our state, for our nation. Way more, please hear me, way more than any governmental official that's going to be elected on Tuesday or four years from now or eight years now. And I'm not saying that those things aren't important and that we shouldn't vote our conscience. But what I'm saying is we need an awakening like Jacob had at Bethel to understand 
The position that we as the church have been given as it relates to government flowing on the earth. He said, your descendants, here's what he said, will be as numerous as the dust of the earth, which we are a part of that reality right now. And they will spread out in all directions. And all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. Okay. That goes for injustice. That goes for brokenness in culture. That goes for racism. That goes for you fill in the blank of anything that ills our society and our culture. The remedy for those realities will flow through his people across the globe by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jacob gets up and he takes that pillow where he was asleep and he turns it, that rock, and he turns it upright and he makes a pillar. You gotta check this out. You read it in verse 18 of chapter 28. He turns the pillow into a pillar. This is important. At some point, the church has to wake up and turn their pillow into a pillar. What is a pillar? I wrote this down. A pillar is a fundamental support for a superstructure. Go look it up in the dictionary. It's a fundamental support for a superstructure. I'm not preaching to you today. I'm, I'm really overflowing here because I believe what I'm talking about. I believe that there's a superstructure called the government of God, called the kingdom of heaven, that is more powerful than we even realize. And we have minimized it so much that we're looking to all kinds of other things to solve what is the longing of our heart and God wants us to turn our pillow where we are asleep into a pillar and set up a superstructure on the earth that's going to bring justice where injustice has reigned, bring wholeness where brokenness has been, bring sight where there's been blindness, been, you fill in the blank. In fact, he's so moved by this word that he, he gives a tenth of all that he had, verse 22, into what was happening. That's pre-law. It was grace. He was like, man, I'm giving into this thing. It's a powerful. So to get more understanding, let's move to the New Testament quick. We've got to move fast. Nathan and his encounter with Jesus. Remember Nathaniel? John chapter 1, Jesus is going to Galilee and, and Philip um, comes and is found of Jesus, and Jesus says to Philip, come follow me. All right? And Philip was from Bethsaida, the word says in verse 44, Andrew and Peter's hometown, and Philip went to a guy named Nathaniel, and he told him, listen, we have found the very person that Moses, is it going out? Let's pause. Let's breathe. All right. He said, we found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about, and his name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now listen to what, what Nathaniel said. Can anything good come from Nazareth? There's no power in anybody found that was raised in Nazareth. There's no authority. There's no potential for transformation from a Nazarite. He said, come and see for yourself. And when he showed up, Jesus says to Nathaniel, this is crazy. He said, here's a genuine son of Israel. A man of in complete integrity. In other words, that, that literally means no guile, no deceit. Wait a minute. I mean, this guy's not even supporting Jesus. He doesn't think he has any power or authority. 
He's actually vocalized that with his, with his own words. And Jesus prophesies over him, here's a son of this nation that I'm going to raise up. Who's going to be a part of the government that's going to be released on the earth. And there's no deceit found in him. Nathaniel asked Jesus, how did you know about me? And Jesus said, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Now imagine, because he was sitting under this fig tree. Imagine he comes to Jesus, doesn't think he's powerful, doesn't think he has any influence, asked him how he knew about him and, and called him this, this, this son of Israel, this one who there was no deceit found in him. He's like, how did you know about me? And he said, before Philip found you, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Boom. He's like, oh my gosh. Because he was, he was sitting under a fig tree. Fig tree, Darren, where are you going with this? I'm, I'm wrapping this up. You got to catch me. Don't lose, don't lose sight here. It's really important what you hear, what you hear from here on out. You see, fig trees represented the nation of Israel in the natural You remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree? The reason he cursed it was because it wasn't bearing any fruit. But there was a new nation that was rising up and it was gonna rise up in one like this man named Nathaniel. The cursing of the fig tree occurs four days before Jesus' crucifixion. The story is, is placed right next to and intentionally to the story of, of Jesus overturning the tables in the temple. You remember that? Because you see, they had deceit. They, had, they were corrupt. Everything was broken in that system. The money had just come into the temple and it made this place a den of thieves and there was no more power. There was no more authority. They knew the right words to say, but they didn't have their hearts in the right place. Listen, God, listen, please hear me. God will shake everything in every single person's life that says they know Jesus right down to the place where everything that man we've held on to that we thought had value and didn't goes. Nathaniel had this experience with God because he saw him under the fig tree, but in verse 50, he says, do you believe just because I gave you a prophetic word? Like, I love prophetic words, but prophetic words at the end of the day don't mean a hill of beans if we just have some like, aha, Holy Spirit moment, like, oh my gosh, that person knew this and this and this about me, just like Jesus. And Jesus was coming and he was challenging Nathaniel. And he said, do you believe just because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? He said, I'm telling you, you're gonna see greater things than this. Prophecy is only pointing to one thing and it's called the gospel. This verse 51, he says, I, I tell you, verse 51 in chapter one, he said, I tell you the truth, you will see, listen to this, heaven opened and angels from God going up and down, the son of man, who is the stairway between heaven and earth. <laughs> you think Jacob had an encounter? Nathan, Nathaniel, you will see this in your life. It won't be a dream. It'll be a reality. Because when I die on that cross and I now bridge heaven and earth, there's a new access point for you that wasn't available to Jacob. Like it is to you. And these messengers of grace, that's what angels are. Think of it this way. There's divine infusion of something otherworldly on the inside of you that you're like, how did this get here? What is this? This is different. This is bigger than just going to church. This is bigger than just reading my Bible and praying a little bit every day because I feel like I have to. No, there's a reality that you understand that, that the, the bridge between heaven and earth that was cut off has now been 
brought into reality through this one named the Son of God. Oh. Twenty years after the dream that Jacob had, he has this face-to-face encounter with with the Lord, with Jesus himself. I I believe it to be the pre-incarnate Christ, remember? And he wrestles with him all night. Chapter 32, verses 24 through 30, 26, you'll have to read it for yourself. But he has a hold of the Lord, and I love this. The Lord says, let me go, and he said, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Now here's the deal. We don't have to beg God for anything. It's already been accomplished for us, but let me, let me say this. I think there's something very, very particular at this moment that God wants to do in our hearts where we're like, Lord, I know this is a reality because I've had the revelation of it. Heaven is now joined with the earth. All of what is there in that realm is possible to be able to come down and affect this other realm. All of God and and his, his heart, his culture, where there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no brokenness, there's no deceit, there's no whatever the case may be in that place, we can see it and say, God, have your way. Let your kingdom come and your will be done here as it is there. I know that to be true. So I'm gonna grab a hold of you as you've grabbed a hold of me and I'm not letting go until I start to see some of this. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. I'm gonna be honest. Whatever happens on Tuesday is not gonna affect my, I'm I'm just, hear me, it's not gonna affect me in the way that it's gonna affect some other people, whichever way it goes. Because I've seen something that's bigger than all of that. And I, I, I have this understanding in my heart that I've, I've got a hold of this one and he's got a hold of me. And I'm not letting go because he's not letting go of me until we start to see some of the things that we see, if you will, right? His, his hip is dislocated and his name is changed. He walked with a limp the rest of his life. You know, brokenness is okay. In fact, brokenness is better than okay because when you've been humbled, when you just are like, man, outside of God touching me, like there's nothing I could really do in my own strength. When you've gone through a fire and you've made it to the other side by the grace of God, you've got something to say now. You're not just an echo in the earth, you're a voice. You have authority, you have, you have something real to bring when you've been through a trial, when you've gone through brokenness in a relationship or, or with, with a situation or whatever the case may be. God is coming and feeling your weakness with his power. He's actually perfecting it. What's amazing is the fruit that we see in Jacob. And this is just, this is a foreshadowing of what we're to walk through. His brother who hated him and was trying to kill him and that Jacob tried to usurp and did usurp his position. When he sees Jacob 20 years after the dream, he says, when I look at you now, it's like seeing the face of God. Could you imagine like looking at your enemy or looking at the one that you ripped off or looking at the one who you trampled over to try to get ahead and later go, man, now when I see you, it's like I see the face of God. Jesus, Jesus, what would it be like? a person who had an opinion, a perception, a bias towards someone of a different nationality or a different color, had an encounter with you that when they now saw that person, they were like seeing, as it says here with Jacob, it was like they were seeing now the face of God. Value. Lord, what if, what if, chauvinist men who who 
looked at women through a degrading lens their whole life as nothing but objects had an encounter with you and now when they saw a female it was like they were seeing the face of God Lord there's lots of illustrations that I could bring up but I'm asking you God today before your throne that God we would have an encounter with you in such a profound way that Lord when we see even our worst enemy that it would be like seeing the face of God. One created in your image, Lord. Would you, would you do something so profound in our lives that, God, we could come into that kind of encounter? Last thing, everybody look at me for just a second. You know, Jacob, you, you know, he, his son was Joseph, one of his, his last son. And Joseph was the one, what time is it, yep. Yeah. Joseph was the one who climbed to the position second highest to Pharaoh. And if you look at the story, Jacob at the end of his life was introduced to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet. Instead, instead of Jacob vying for position, trying to get a lunch date with Pharaoh, trying to get invited to a cabinet meeting, he just goes and blesses him. And then it says he turns his back on Pharaoh and walks away. Oh, do you understand what that means? That meant death. He sees this one created in the image of God and he goes and blesses him. But he's not moved by his power. He turns his back on him and walks away. Because I believe as he turned, he was seeing another one seated on the throne of all authority. This one that had met him in that place. Last thing, because you got to catch this. Do you remember when Bill said this? He, he was talking about Jesus being on that throne of authority. Talk about government. Talk about rule. And no one could open this scroll. But then they start calling out, Jesus can do it. The lamb who was slain, that has overcome all things, that, that, that rose up out of death, hell, and the grave, he can open it up. But here's what we miss. Not only has Jesus come into your heart, but more importantly, you've come into his. It's both. He resides in you, but now you're consumed in him. It's like that living water has been put on the inside of you, but now you've been thrown into the ocean of his love called Christ the risen one. You know what that means? That means now you here on the earth, you here in South Florida, you're connected to where he is because not only is he in you, but you're in him. And where is he right now? He's reigning on a throne over all things. And you're seated with him there. You're not next to him, you're inside of him. So the authority that he had to release something on the earth, you do as well. Oh my gosh, come on, come on, come on. So what's happening? We're standing back waiting for somebody else to do it, looking for some big powerful person to be whatever, to rescue us. God uses people, I'm not against that. I think that's beautiful. But what is the Lord wanting to do in the church? Oh my gosh. Turn a pillow into a pillar. Turn a pillow into a pillar. Turn slumber into empowerment. Turn just dreams into reality. Could you stand with me all over this place? Come on, let's, let's lift our hands to God. Let's all, even wherever you are watching this, whether it's today or tomorrow or a week from now, as we lift our hands to heaven, God, we, we look and we behold and we see this one with fire in his eyes, with love in his heart, Lord, for the entirety of the world. And we see a church that's been given an opening to the reality in which he now dwells after coming to the earth and overcoming all things. 
and God, this one lives inside of us and we live inside of him. And we're at a moment in human history, God, like no other. Like no other, God, would you wake us up? Would you come to your church, not only in South Florida, but in our nation and around the world? Come on, pray with me. God, would you wake us up? Would you encounter us in the night? Would you speak to us, God? We adore you, God. We worship you. We just, we enthrone you once again with our praise. So come and consume There's none like you, Lord. We look to you. We want you. Come on, say that. We want you, God. We want you to come. Come and consume God. Oh, we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. Oh, God. Would you invite us into the dream that you have dreamed for us instead of what someone else has said our dream is supposed to look like? <laughs> Before the foundations of the earth, the thing that you've had in your heart for this generation, would it manifest in Jesus' name? The thing that you have in your heart for the church, I'm not talking about some building or some service on a Sunday. I'm talking about your bride, which is people. Those that have been encountered by the love of God. I'm asking that the dream that you have for that church would come. In fact, I agree with that reality right now over our city, over our nation. And Lord, I put my trust I put my hope, I put the surety of my future in that ladder, that one upon whom angels ascend and descend from heaven to the earth, Jesus Christ. I grab a hold of him, and though the dawn is breaking, a new day, I won't let go, because I didn't rustle through the night just to let go when the daybreak comes. I'm going to hold on so I can see the radiance of that one shine. Have your way. Just put your hand over your heart as we close and say, have your way. Have your way in me. Wake me up to your dream, God. Wake me up to the fact that I've been consumed by you, that I sit where you're seated, yet walk where I'm walking, and the two realities become one. If you've got discouragement going on in your heart, if you feel nervous, if you feel anxiety, if you feel fear in this moment, Lord, let the peace of your spirit come over every heart. If there's sickness in a body today, God, I'm asking for divine healing to manifest with cancer, diabetes, skin disorders. Lord, whatever the case may be, I'm asking for your power to come over people. 
Thank you, Lord. I'm asking for such a peace to rest over your body over the next few days that, Lord, it would supernaturally invade the very cities that we live in, people that would be so upturned or overcome by whatever emotion, they couldn't do it because the radiation of the peace of God flowing from your bride changes the atmosphere. Come on, pray with me. Lord, changes the very atmosphere. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Listen, go in peace. God bless you. We'll see you online and in person next week in our small groups. God bless you.